So just first of all, thank you, Pedro, for the invitation. And thank you, Daniel, for having this conference. I think this is a very important conference at a very important time with this, this new technology. Uh, I'm very excited to be sharing some of our insights here and being able to share them with you. I only wish we could all do this in person where we could have more of an exchange, but maybe in the future. Um, so today, I'm gonna to talk about environmental, how environmental DNA can provide new insights into some of our ecological systems. And I wanna say all the information that I'm going to be giving today uh, is not stuff that I've collected, but our team at the National Genomic Center, which I'll describe in a moment, uh, collected, including all these folks who have used eDNA in all sorts of ways on, uh, on everything from wolverine, as you see in this picture on the upper left, to a lot of fish uh, and some, some large salamanders on the lower right. Now, the National Genomic Center for Wildlife and Fish Conservation focuses on, has, it's been around for a long time, and we've been focusing on three different types of genetics. Connectivity and non-invasive sampling, which we've done for a long time with many mammals, trying to understand how they move and can we detect them, especially rare mammals. We've been working in genomics for the past five to 10 years. But then in 2012, we had a big push to get into environmental DNA. And that has really taken over our genomic center. A little bit more about the agency in which the Genomic Center is in. And I only tell you this so you can understand the perspective that I'm coming from and why I'm asking the questions and even why I'm using certain tools. Uh, it's because of, the, because of the agency I work for. I work for a management agency that is responsible for 78 million hectares of land or 193 million acres of land. We provide the research that managers can use to manage and conserve multiple landscapes. And that means they're managing for timber and recreation and wilderness and wildlife and water. Uh, my group collaborates with a lot of other agencies who have a lot of other land, land bases as well. And this National Genomic Center really started in 1999 to try to provide new genetic information to this agency called the US Forest Service. And there's our website, you can look us up and we have some stuff there that, that I won't be covering today. Okay, as for today's narrative, what I'm gonna talk about today is essentially this. This is literally my conclusion, my intro. So I really think that to manage ecological systems requires an understanding of both the species distributions but you can't get at those species distributions without species interactions. But it's very difficult to accomplish this because so many species that are threatened or endangered are cryptic and difficult to detect. Therefore, we need new technologies such as environmental DNA to conserve our valued ecosystems, okay? Now, I gave this a try. Forgive me if there's something horrible here. Uh, thank you to Google Scholar for a little translation. I really think that this is a synopsis. This is my thesis today. So I did want to at least be respectful and put something together uh, um, for, for the audience. Okay, the mile post for today. Here's where we're going to go for the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk today about a large effort in environmental DNA that gets at species distributions. And in this case, we're going to talk about bull trout, and I'll tell and one of our largest efforts to date. And I bring, I'm talking about this specifically because we just submitted a paper a few weeks ago um, that's a, a follow up on our huge efforts. So I'm very excited about these data. Then I'm going to talk about how we're using not just getting at distributions, but how we can go beyond distributions and understand the interactions of species. And then I, because I know this is a metabarcoding conference, I want to talk about some, some of the ways that we're using metabarcoding with eDNA. And then finally, I'd like to spend a few minutes looking over the horizon 
and thinking about what's coming next and where do we need to move as a field in environmental DNA to be most effective. Okay, so we're gonna talk about bull trout. Bull trout are just one of the species. We probably work on close to 75 species, individual species in my group. Bull trout are a salmonid species that are threatened in the, in the Rocky Mountains. They need cold, clear, complex, meaning wood trees in the river and connected river systems. So think of mountain streams that are connected to one another, with lots of lots of trees that provide cover. These fish are huge. They can grow up to 105 centimeters, 15 kilograms. They're great indicators of healthy rivers and lakes, but their populations have been declining. And both conservationists and fishermen and anglers are concerned. So what is the cause of this decline and what's limiting their distribution? And what can we do it? Where can we be effective in our actions? That's what we're, we've been charged with trying to understand. And when eDNA first came around, we thought to ourselves, this could be a really good tool to try to understand the distribution of this very hard to detect species. So we went out to this small stream, not very far from my house, about 40 minutes from my house, in this, in this remote river system. And the picture on the left shows that the river network, the big thick line is the border between Montana where I live, up near the Canadian border and Idaho, the neighboring state. And we can look at 15 years of electrofishing data. And in those 15 years, there were, there were four detections of bull trout, and they were unsure if they should manage the system for bull trout anymore. Now we look at the picture on the right, and we can see that we went out three different visits, maybe uh, eight hours total, uh, a little longer, and you can see not only did we detect bull trout where we found them before, but we found them in new places. So we were really impressed. We put together a matrix that looks like this, where what's really impressive, where electrofishing found them present, they were present with eDNA 16 out of 16 times, where they're absent 24 out of 24. And what we're really impressed with is the seven places where the electrofishing didn't find them, but they were present. So they're really exciting with this paired data. We published this in 2016, and we said, okay, let's scale this up just a little bit. How can we scale this up? So if we are gonna try bringing this from just 47 different sites, we're gonna take this and try an effort that is 10,000 sites. And so we started to do that. We thought, let's go big. But we realized we wanted to survey the entire Columbia River Basin, which is about uh, 600 kilometers by 400 kilometers. Uh, so quite, quite a large area. We realized we couldn't just sample that alone. We needed to, to refine, at least have some understanding about where we should start to look for these bull trout. So the first thing we did is we worked with some of our modeling team uh, where they took, stream, we know new stream temperature was important. So this picture in the upper left, stream temperature. We aggregated 200 million hourly records of stream temperature across 20,000 stream sites. We put it together with whatever kind of data we could find on species distributions, um, however bad they were. We put them together and came up with an occupancy probability of bull trout. And I'll show you this map up close. Here's this map. The, red, the blue areas have a probability above 0.9 of, and these are all stream segments. The yellow areas are above 0.5 and the red areas are above 0.1. So very low probability of detecting a bull trout in those red areas. He said, this is a very nice hypothesis. Let's go test that with eDNA. Let's go out there and let's try at least testing the areas, all stream segments that are 0.9 or 0.5. So we did that by building a big partner. We got some grants. We built a big partner network. Um, and this became what we call the range-wide bull trout eDNA project. We said to anyone 
any natural resource agency, any tribe, any anyone, if you're willing to collect samples in a location and in a manner which we're, which we uh, approve, we will run the sample for free. We, we have we decided to use our grants that way instead of field sampling ourselves. Now we did do some field sampling, but we basically said, if you guys can go do this, if you can go out there we, uh, and get the sample, we will run the sample and tell you what, if you have, what you have for a species. The other thing we did is we provided, we made sure that we could provide everyone a map of where to sample. We took the, all the existing rivers. Now this actually took quite a lot of time and put a sampling grid, a one kilometer sampling grid on what they call the NHD stream network, which you can download online across the entire Western United States. And we're gonna come back to this map here, this little Blackfoot River, which is about, four, again, 40 minutes a different direction from where I live right now. Um, and this area I think is really special because there was, it was very questionable whether it should be managed for bull trout and it had not been managed for bull trout for a long time. The other thing we did, and this is almost as important as any of the new technologies, which I'll share later, so we can do the most cutting edge, next generation technology, whatever we do, uh, we can go to do you know, meta barcoding, we can, we can develop new approaches. It doesn't matter if you don't get your sampling done right and on a and get people to believe and follow your the same sampling, you can actually end up with uh, none of the back end work matters. And so what we did is we put together a protocol and we put together a sampling kit. And we said, if you're going to sample with us and if you want us to, to sample for, for free, we will send you a pump, which is number two in this picture on the right. And we will send you every piece of equipment here. You just send us back the pump after two weeks. It was like a library. You have two weeks. We'll put together all these kits. And so basically we had a small army of people assembling kits in our basement to then send out to our collaborators and they could follow the directions, almost you know, follow the directions in the manual we gave them to the left. At the time I tested it with my eight-year-old son. I gave him the directions. I gave him the kit. I said, can you go sample this lake? And I just watched him do it. He did it perfectly. I figured if an eight-year-old can do it, there was a very, very good chance that at least 25% of the scientists would be able to follow it correctly. Okay, we partnered over the last four to five years with all sorts of teams. Here's the area in red that was sampled, 10,000 sites in the past four years. So this has been very exciting. And just to, so you understand what we did, we have eDNA from our target stream. We filtered using this filter here in the middle, pulled our 1.2 micron filter. We then just used qPCR. And we're gonna talk a lot about this in a few minutes. We decided to go with a, a qPCR, a real-time PCR, uh, instead of a meta barcoding approach. Well, partially because at the time when we started this, Meta barcoding was not really fe as feasible as it is now, but we also wanted the extreme sensitivity. And what I mean by that, and, and we'll talk about this later as well. But what I mean by that is we did some internal sequencing and in internal work to, to really come up with this graph. And I should have changed my picture from a Wolverine to a, to a, because uh, we have, we thought about this with Wolverine as well, but uh, I should have changed the picture to a, to a bulk shout, but, um, Look, the downside on the far left, this red dot, we have extreme sensitivity to detect our rare species, but you only get one species. When you go far to the right, we really thought initially that we were gonna get into, this is back in 2012 to 2014, we thought we're gonna get into do shotgun sequencing, get everything in the stream. We really liked that approach, but the sensitivity was not there. And for species that are rare, that where the probability of detection was good, um, but, not, but not as high as we would like, we decided we needed this sensitivity of the qPCR and to not go with barcoding. And actually, one of my take home messages of today is you need to use the right eDNA tool at the right time for the, for the right question. So we have the qPCR analysis, what we went with. Um, we developed our own internal markers. Um, we've developed actually two different sets of bull trout markers that we used. And we went out there and created and, and we worked with our partners and sampled across the West, 
all of this data. Now, one of the things I really appreciate about the team, my team is they were very dedicated. There were I had a few scientists that said, look, we need to put all of these data, positive detections, negative, unsampled sites. We need to put them all online. And we did. You can look this up uh, from our website. I actually put a link here as well, but you can also just type in range-wide bull trout analysis or eDNA Atlas and eDNA Archive. What this shows are all of our samples that we collected. And you can download any of this information um, in the eDNA. Now the eDNA Atlas is the information itself. It's on an ArcGIS framework. The eDNA Archive, we have every one of those filters that we collected our sample in. So if another species issue comes up, if there's a stream that all of a sudden there's a new invasive species nearby, we can look at any of the samples and go back and reanalyze. So we think this is gonna be a nice archive for future use. Okay, so we have this dynamic web portal where you can download the data, you can see what samples, when the samples were collected and whether, uh, you, whether if you're a natural resource agency, whether you should go back and reanalyze uh, and resample that stream. Um, and you can download and look at any of the data in any way you would like. Okay, just a few, um, before I give you the big summary, a few fun things that have come out of this. I showed you initially this area called the Little Blackfoot River and Ontario Creek. I'll give you the red dot here. The red dot was a sample collected in 1990, was the only positive detection on this river. And the agency that's responsible for the management of this land said, we don't think bull trout were present there. We're not going to manage this for bull trout. It's very, it's one of the furthest, it's a, an area on the periphery of their range. We went back, we went out there, we sampled this with every blue dot here is a sample that shows where we found bull trout. So in fact, here's an area on the edge of the distribution that was not being managed for bull trout, but all of a sudden now we can show a very strong presence of the species. We were so uncertain about the result, we went back, and this is the beauty of environmental DNA, we went back one afternoon and said, let's just resample. Let's just take an afternoon and resample just to make sure that we're not making a mistake. We resampled, got the exact same pattern, felt very strong um, that we were, we were confident we had this species present. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, what could that DNA have come from somewhere else in the system? I, I'm not gonna show you today, but we've done a lot of field tests in fishless streams, streams without fish, where we put a group of fish into the stream, three fish in the stream, three small body fish in the stream, and we sample downstream. We know that we have an 85% probability of detecting fish up to a kilometer away, but that signal, uh, that, that signal attenuates as you go further downstream to where you get no detection shortly after. Okay, now, what did we do with all this? We took all of our data, and actually I shouldn't say all of our data, we took about half of our data and reanalyzed it. Uh, so we have that first paper, that first map I showed you with the yellow, the red, and the blue. That was our hypothesis. We now could go out there and we just submitted this paper and you'll see on the bottom here, we submitted it to ecological applications. Um, and we asked this exact question um, about bull trout. What did we learn with all of our eDNA samples? So in this case, we used 5,336 eDNA samples in 399 patches, okay? So let me, let me walk you through the data set a little bit. Start at the top. The area we're looking at, 128,000 square kilometers of complex mountainous terrain. We have a network of 51,000 kilometers of stream reaches that are under 15% slope. We started off with a patch. The area has 991 patches of of water and a patch I'll describe in a minute. We were able to take the historical electrofishing data that, that we built the initial models with and add to it 5,336 eDNA samples in 399 patches to it. 
And a patch is just a, a contiguous area sampled at one kilometer intervals that had a mean August temperature of under 11 degrees Celsius. Now you remember, these things need cold water. It had a discharge of 0 0.0057 meters cubed per second and had a slope under 15%. So we had these predefined patches that we've been using, that our fisheries biologists have been using for years. We sampled, we can talk about 399 of those patches. And we asked the question, what variables affected distribution? We then modeled that distribution under three climate scenarios and 16 different restoration scenarios. So what happens if we remove roads? What if we prevent wildfire? What if we add connectivity? And let me walk you through a few of these results because I'm, I'm really excited about these results because it really does show that we are getting beyond the, oh, great, we can detect something. It's very exciting to detect things, but can we actually get some ecological insights? So first of all, the map on the left, this, we have a couple of lines I wanna walk you through. Here's the map on the left. The, um, most of the observations that you see in the upper right corner are, in Montana, some are in Idaho. Um, the white line you're looking at there is the continental divide. And the black dots are where we had occupied patches, the white are where we had unoccupied patches. Some of these areas, big chunks of this area are in wilderness areas, very difficult to sample locations. To the right is the table with descriptive statistics of the, of the bull trout patches that we looked at. With our model, our best model correctly predicted bull trout occupancy status in 82.6% of the patches and included effects for uh, patch size estimated as habitat volume, extent of within patch reaches under, six, under nine degrees Celsius, August temperature, distance to the nearest occupied patch, road density, and invasive, bull uh, invasive species, which in this case is called a brook trout. And then also the frequency of high flows during winter. I'm gonna show you what this means. This is what this is looking like. Um, if you look at these graphs, everything here at the x-axis is patch volume. On the y-axis is your occurrence probability. So as patch volume goes up, we read from left to right, we see that the probability of detecting a bull trout increases. And then we can look at different variables. So let's look at A, where it's a positive correlation. We see that as uh, patch volume goes up, occupancy goes up, as the number of stream kilometers of streams under nine degrees Celsius goes up. So as we get to like 18 kilometers, this red line here, we have a much higher probability than when we have very few kilometers of stream under nine degrees Celsius. Let's look at B, and I won't walk you through each of these, but I just wanna show you B and C. B, we see connectivity. The red line says when you have 50 kilometers of, um, 50 kilometers to your nearest occupied patch, so a very long distance, you're gonna have a very low probability of having a bull trout, especially if you have a small patch volume. As the patch volume gets higher, you have higher probability. Um, if you're only a few kilometers away, three, seven, even 13 kilometers away, you have a very good probability or much higher probability of having a bull trout. And in terms of road density, which is something we can manage for on the landscape, we can see that if you have three kilometers per square kilometer of road density, which is a fairly high road density, that you're going to have a lower probability if you get rid of your roads, which are which cause dust and siltification of the stream, gets more turbidity in the stream. Um, it's definitely harmful for, for and it definitely impacts connectivity as these roads sometimes wash out. And so as you have lower road density, you get a much higher probability, especially at a large patch volume. So next we went and we took these data. And I won't go into this too much. Um, you, you can just look at them as one bar each. Don't worry about the different colors here, but um, we have, we've modeled 16 different scenarios. 
each scenario. So scenario one, nine, and 13 are just climate change scenarios. And number one is our current conditions. Number nine is a one degree Celsius change. And number 13 is a, is a two degree Celsius change. And you can just see the patch volume, how much volume is available to these species, uh, to the bull trout really changes as the climate progresses. So this is a big factor for us. Now, the other 16 scenarios we use represent a range of restoration strategies. Um, unfortunately, as we change, as we improve these strategies, so strategies would be remove roads, increase connectivity, increase connectivity to the nearest patch. The, the results were unfortunately, they suggested that regional improvements in bull trout, bull trout status were very difficult to achieve in realistic strategies without spending a fortune in restoration um, due to the pervasive nature of climate change. And it really showed that we're gonna have limited extent of our ability to restore these streams at, across the whole network. A positive is that I think it, give, it lets us see what we really need to be doing is focusing on our strongholds and saying there are some places that are gonna remain strong even given climate change. And if we can do restoration in those strongholds, those strongholds represent, given our model here, uh, about a five to 21%, five to 21 percent of our patches could be qu quantified as strongholds. And it really does take a, there's a large um, a large amount of habitat by volume in those strongholds, about 72 percent of our habitat by volumes in those strongholds. So if we can work on those areas, keep them strong, keep them connected, keep the road density low there, we can have an effective conservation strategy. So it does point to where we can and where we can put our conservation dollars and where we can't. So if you think about that, we've gone from, where I've taken you on this journey so far is from sampling just a few locations, 47 locations, to, does this work? Can we detect them? to, wow, we can now move to a conservation strategy based on our results. Okay, a few more things I wanna to share today. Uh, the, the next thing I wanna share and is, is some of our fine scale environmental DNA work. This gentleman on the right is Dr. Taylor Wilcox, one of the early career scientists in my group. And I really like this work because he's now looking at a fine scale environmental DNA sampling result that looks at what's going on between the bull trout, the native species, and the brook trout, an invasive species. And what Taylor was able to do is to take these same data. And again, we are just starting to investigate what we can do with this big data set. So it's really fun to have the data set. We now are now trying to work with all different types of collaborators to see what we can do. What he's done is he looked at 630 sites across just 54 cold water patches. And here's his map in this, in what we call it the Clark Fork Rock Creek drainage. So um, here's the stream network in blue. The black dots are detected bull trout, white dots are not detected in our survey. He then went out and took the same filters that we had already collected and reanalyze them for brook trout. And he has early versus late fluorescence. Yellow is a late fluorescence. Red is an early fluorescence. Early fluorescence would suggest a higher number. We actually have a few studies that show that the abundance correlates with fluorescence. So early fluorescence is a higher abundance of, of brook trout. Um, on average, um, a, very, a very high correlation. In fact, a study, we, a paired study we did at a 0.7 R squared between abundance and fluorescence. So he takes these data on brook trout. He then pairs them with at the time, or he'll probably, re he'll probably go back and redo this now that we have our new results. But he uh, looked at flow, temperature, and slope as modeled here in this picture. And he then was able to look at how the variables, the environmental variables, and the species were interacting. So let me just walk you through this graph. Here are some of these results from our group. We have mean summer temperature on the x-axis, mean summer 
low on the y-axis. We have this cloud here that are all our sampling points. Um, and you can see most of the sampling points in this region were in this range, eight to 10 degrees Celsius, um, with a low flow between one and 10 um, cubic feet per second, CFS. Okay, so this is our sampled habitat universe. Now we have a few points that are extremely high flow sites with, you know, with higher degrees of temperature, but this is generally our sampling universe. Okay, this is what these streams look like. Now, bull trout detections, if we look at this, where they were overrepresented versus where they're underrepresented, they were overrepresented in large stream habitats. So we got uh, 9.32 bull trout versus uh, 9.32 versus 3.76 cubic feet per stream in, in our um, where we found bull trout versus where we did not. Okay, so it's saying we're seeing them overrepresented in a little bit higher flow streams, places with a higher 9.32, that's this line right here, cubic feet per second streams. Now, um, what gets, gets really interesting when you start to bring in the invader, the brook trout in those streams where you have high brook trout invasion, what we see is that bull trout displace from this area to higher volume, higher cubic feet per second streams, so streams with more flow. So basically the brook trout is, are squeezing, they, they like these smaller habitats, they're squeezing the bull trout out of the smaller habitat. So here's this red circle that represents where on this graph bull trout were at prior to brook trout invasion or what we would presume to be prior. And red here is where they're overrepresented in areas with brook trout invasion. Okay, and here I put this, this red circle here. We'll see this red circle in a minute. Now here's some of the modeling details. Um, we used some general linear mixed models and some hierarchical model selection. And we basically can see that as mean summer flow goes up, our probability of detection, detecting bull trout goes up. We can also see that as we have more brook trout per copies per stream, we really start to see this low, uh, this very um, precipitous decline in our ability to detect bull trout. So there is a strong interaction here. Now, that means we now know that a lot of these thermally suitable habitats are quite small. We know that these are gonna be very susceptible to climate change. And so we can ask the question at a detailed level, what happens to bull trout when they get squeezed between the invas invasive species and climate change? And so here's our map. If you remember, here are the circles. This is a bull trout without uh, brook trout. Here's a bull trout with Brook trout on the bigger circle here. Can't always tell if my pointer's working. Um, and so let's put some climate scenarios in. Here's where our current scenario, we then start to move our habitat based on climate change and what we expect predicted temperatures to be in 2040 under uh, very uh, one climate scenario and then 2080, okay? I'm just gonna go back because what you hear basically, what I'm basically showing you is we have bull trout that are making uh, a living right now here. They get squeezed to this, get squeezed up to smaller streams with the invader. And then we throw climate change in. And basically what we're seeing is their habitat. This is their, their habitat is moving away, getting warmer, leaving very few spaces, very little ecological space for these bull trout to make a living. So we can say that brook trout can displace bull trout from key habitat. And what I think is important for anyone that's not interested necessarily in this system, but really our species distribution models that we build from our environmental DNA needs to account for more than just physical and environmental variables. Okay. We also, it's also fun that we can go from crowdsourced data, data that we're using multiple partners to collect to big ecological inference on how species are interacting with one another. Okay, now for the rest of this talk, 
I want to go two different places. Very quickly, again, I want to be respectful that this talk, this, um, this meeting is about meta barcoding. And I think some of you are saying, okay, that's nice. That's qPCR data. What about meta barcoding? And I want to talk about why, what we, how we're thinking about meta barcoding. I'll show you two quick examples. I figure I'll talk uh, eight more minutes or so and let me know if I'm off. If somebody wants less or more, I can adjust. Um, so I'd like to give me five minutes about meta barcoding and some examples, and then four or five minutes about where I think the future of this whole environmental DNA process is going. So first of all, I love meta barcoding. I think it's a very, very powerful tool when used at the right time. Our, we've been very highly concerned about meta barcoding because we, I work for a natural resource agency where a positive detection can trigger a suite of different laws that, uh, or at least actions based off of one positive detection. And I think it's very hard sometimes, I think we've found in our initial efforts with meta barcoding, we can put in all sorts of filters, but there's always some unusual species showing up in our species list. And so we try to always avoid the meta barcoding approach in when the question is very sensitive to what we find as a detection. And I think we've probably all seen this, Anyone that's done meta barcoding, you can be doing, uh, if you're looking through your species detection list, you put in a filter and maybe the species you're concerned with shows up as a few copies, but then so does something like African elephant. And you say, how do I, how do I make sense of this? So we are always concerned with that, not because of African elephant, but, but always concerned because sometimes some species that is even a native species shows up on our list that would trigger a management action, and it's unclear what to do with that. So we've tried to be more precise in our questions, is something present? And that's really pushed us to this qPCR approach. Okay, that doesn't mean we don't use meta barcode, and we certainly do use it, and we're using it more and more for different questions that are not as sensitive to the individual detections, but it's why, uh, it's why we've been really concerned. We need this high sensitivity, we need a low error rate. What we have been moving to, I'll show you here is we've been moving from qPCR to these high throughput qPCR approaches. This has kind of been the latest thing that we've largely been using that uses a chip to facilitate thousands of parallel analyses. Now we don't own this machine. We send our plates out to uh, a place that's about uh, eight hour drive away. So uh, we have to we fly it down there. Um, but recently we did about 3000 analyses um, that that completed by a single technician in two weeks. And so we really think we can scale this up. We have a publication on this uh, parallel targeted analysis of environmental samples through high throughput qPCR, again, led by Taylor Wilcox, where we actually compared sensitivity, if you look at the graph on the right, between the HT qPCR and the qPCR, we found fantastic results with bull trout, brook trout, brown trout, and rainbow trout. Uh, we had one species that didn't get as good of results. We think it's a marker problem. But this is an approach that we're starting to use. So we develop our chips that can look at both streams and some of our carnivore work where we are sampling, uh, sampling snow and other substrates. Um, and we can actually, we can, it's, it's pretty exciting. We can, we can now test for multiple species with our high throughput qPCR. So we can test for 15, 20, 30, 40 species all at once. So we're pretty excited about this approach as a way to move us forward. That's not quite meta barcoding, but asking specific questions on a suite of, like I said, anywhere from three to 25 species. Okay, what about meta barcoding? I wanna show you just very quickly, check my time, very quickly, two different efforts. Um, one effort is eDNA and stream assignment and I just got these data yesterday or two days ago from our team. And then I'm just going to show you a quick diet analysis that I, I still call in the realm of eDNA. It's something that we're using meta barcoding for. Here, this is just a quick, uh, this is uh, really fresh data. So we haven't really analyzed it that much yet. 
Um, we're starting to build, starting to use eDNA for our macro invertebrates. So we sample streams. We're using a meta barcoding approach to test for um, macro invertebrates. There are not good reference databases at all. So we're actually oftentimes using taxonomy free approaches and some machine learning. And again, this is very new stuff we're still just working on. And one of the cool things that we're finding is that if you look at all these creeks here, East Clear Creek, Fossil Oak, Rattlesnake, San Pedro, and Somale, um, we're actually seeing some geographic concordance of the groups within streams. And so we're actually, we might actually be able to use this as a way to identify water bodies based off of the macro invertebrates. Um, but we're not, you know, again, we're still playing around with this approach, but this is a meta barcoding approach. I think I rotated this. Yeah, here's this rotated view. So what gets what's really interesting is these this group, this linear group up in the upper right, the blue, purple, and orange are all these related streams that are one, they're all tributaries of one another. So again, we see some strong geographic concordance in this. We're not sure where we're going to go with it or what we're going to do with this approach, but uh, this is a, a, a new approach that we're trying because we do want to start moving away from some of the very labor intensive macro invertebrate surveys that get done in the United States for stream quality work. Okay, the other approach that we use, and I'll make this quick, the other approach, um, Actually, I'll, I'll quickly skip. I'm going to skip this. The other thing we're doing is, is a lot of diet analyses um, with some of our species that uses a meta barcoding approach. If we have time later. I'll visit this. But we're using, we're really trying to understand pre and post disturbance, what diet shifts are happening with some of our sensitive carnivore species. Okay, the last few minutes, I do want to spend on a bigger issue. Where are we going? When we look across the horizon, where are we going with environmental DNA? Okay, I feel like when we first started, it was, wow, we can detect something. This is a great, how fascinating is this? It's a proof of concept type study. That was all, we were always doing proof of concept. Now we're moving to where we can get to ecological interactions, better species distributions, understanding habitat needs, but where are we going? And I put together a while ago when I was thinking about this, uh, really, eDNA, there's all sorts of developments. There's sampling developments, there's statistical developments, there's laboratory developments, there's database developments, there's question developments, there's what's being sampled developments, and new technology. Um, and all of these are really interesting. I think new technology-wise, what I'm most excited about right now, uh, although we're not really pushing into this front yet, are some of these CRISPR, Cas12, and 13 systems. So this is a picture from the Broad Institute where they're using um, they're using this Sherlock Hudson text, and Sherlock is the specific high sensitivity enzymatic reporter, reporter unlocking. They're using this to detect these systems to detect uh, Zika. They're using it for COVID, and they can be they they're using it. Um, this is all all uh, lamp amplification. So that means you're talking about things that are thermal and you don't need to bring in your uh, PCR. You're, you're able to do these on site. You're able to do these with these colorimeter strips. And what you can see here in their example, you have a, a red line when you have a, a, a negative detection and then a line here, I'm sorry, positive detection. And then this is a negative detection. Um, it depends on the system. I think some of them are actually two-line systems when you have a positive detection. I love this. This is the democratization of science. I think I heard in the last talk people saying, this work is still very expensive. And I agree. Getting Doing metagenomics is still a very expensive approach. If we can get to where we have these types of tests, they can be done for, you know, very inexpensively. We should have a field deployable diagnostic test that can test for the species presence. And I think this is going to be highly important for democratizing all sorts of scientific questions where we don't have to rely on very expensive machines all the time. So this will be, there'll be a time and a place for this approach. And I'm very excited about, about where we're going. And again, it's not that different than, than our qPCR approach. It's just being done 
with a lap amplification, the CRISPR Cas9 system. And if you have you know, no target, you have an uncleaved reporter. And if you get amplified targets, then the, the reporter gets cleaved, giving a signal that then gets picked up on the colorimeter strip. So I, I really think there's a lot of promise to this. We've already seen it being tempted with Salmosar, which is a, a, an Atlantic salmon. And I think there's already some positive results, some very interesting results. So I want to keep an eye on that technology. And as I mentioned, you know, they're rapid, they're inexpensive labs. You have that, you know, if we can move towards this, this issue on the left, where we have these very inexpensive tests, or when we do real-time qPCR on the left, I think we can get a lot more people asking a lot of interesting questions. We don't have to rely on the only people who have access to the big labs, the meta barcoding or the shotgun sequencing labs. We really have this pendulum that's kind of in two places at once. Um, so it's, I think it's very exciting that, that we can move that direction. The, only, the other thing and the last points I wanna make are that the, the most important thing that I think this field can do is go from where we're at currently, where I think currently we spend a lot of our time on tool development and our tool deployment. And we spend, if you read, read through most studies, you're still talking about proof of concepts. We're, we have very few people that are asking the conservation and management question or even the ecological question. What I'd like to see us move towards and what I, would, what I try to encourage all my students is yes, talk about tool development, have the proof of concept, but we can't, we need to move well past that. I'm hoping that in the next, five to 10 years, and we're already seeing that, we still see some healthy tool deployment, but I really wanna see us move towards asking a question up front and saying, is this the right tool to ask that question? Not, can I find, get a detection with an environmental DNA tool? So, I just wanna sum up back where I started. I started with this statement, to effectively manage ecological systems like our river systems, like our systems with many of our endangered species requires an understanding of species interactions that then lead to better species distribution maps. Difficult to accomplish because these species are cryptic and difficult to detect. But when we bring in these new technologies such as eDNA, we can learn about species interactions, we can refine our species distributions, we can decide which management actions are most appropriate to take. So with that, I want to say thank you for listening. And I really wish I was there in person to, to interact with more of you to, to talk about some of our work. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you for your amazing talk. And um, maybe we have time for questions. If someone wants to, to say some questions, can open your microphone or just leave in the chat. I'd just like to say how happy I am to see such a, a really integrated management approach with eDNA there. I followed Taylor's work quite considerably. Um, you know, I, I come from a background a little bit. I worked with Fishbase with Aquamaps and SDMs and things like that. So I, I recognized quite a while ago the importance of this for increasing occurrence data for SDMs. And it's really nice to see how that's being applied in a, a, a truly, a, um, you know, uh, the federal system, yeah, for management. So congratulations, it's really nice. Thank you, I really appreciate that comment. Um, first of all, Taylor Wilcox is one of the most uh, uh, innovative young scientists I've ever worked with. I, I love working with him. I, it, I can't wait to keep following his career. I feel very fortunate we, we were able to. We, we, a quick story, we were able to pick him up as an undergraduate. We had this qPCR machine that we bought for one thing and it didn't work for us. It was sitting in the corner gathering dust. And we thought, oh, there's this eDNA, they're using this qPCR, we don't know. How about we just hire this undergrad and give him the manual and see what he can do with it. Uh, next thing you know, he's coming back and showing us the, the how good it can be. He starts reading the eDNA literature. We were very interested. We were showing him this. We were kind of pointing to it. And he just kept advancing and advancing. And we said, okay, when you're done with that, we're going to pay for your master's. And then we're going to pay for your PhD. And then we're going to bring you in and hire you as a scientist. And we're going to put you in this network 
of other scientists. So I'm really proud of my group for, for just one, picking up Taylor, but two, just the integration of, of all these different people that are really working in a kind of an ego-free environment to, to pull lots of data together. Um, so I feel really fortunate and I really appreciate that comment because um, it, there's so much that we all need to do for management agencies and it's nice to uh, get some small successes and, and I'm really excited, hopefully inspire other management agencies to tackle big, big projects like this and, um, and maybe, learn, maybe learn from some of our mistakes so you don't have to make the same ones we made. Um, just a quick question with the diet analyses. Um, one of the big questions there uh, is the question of secondary consumption and the influence of this on our interpretations of the data. Um, you know, there's some nice stuff coming out of the Cartsinel group showing how the exclusion of rare, uh, rare taxon in the reeds can really change your, in your interpretation of, of diet preferences and functional importance of the diet items. Have you found similar things in the sort of more carnivorous yeah, <laughs> it is. I mean, and that's, a, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, right. I mean, what do you, when you have uh, um, grains and things showing up in a, in a diet of a carnivore, it's okay. Is that because the, the mouse was eating that, that the carnivore just ate, or was it? And yeah, so we have a problem. We're, we're definitely seeing that. And again, that comes down to the questions. I think when you can ask, if you're just asking, hey, what shifted? Okay, maybe. Um, but we, so we have two different kinds. I can think of two diet studies. One, we're looking at invasive owls and trying to get at what species, which endangered species of shorebirds are they eating? So there, you know, you have a very discrete question. You can get away from just the broad generalization. And two, um, we, we, we have worried about that. We've had to put, we put in different filters for sure. Like we, we do have a somewhat of a diet list of what could be eaten. Um, two, and I don't think I can pull it up. Oh, I can. Um, I'm going to show you this one. Do I have it? Yeah, I have one graph. Um, two, with our some of our data. So this is this carnivore, this rare carnivore, uh, fishers. We have big changes in an ecosystem, and I, you know, this is a whole a whole talk for another day. We knew that, that there was a huge set of a huge drought in California. The drought led to huge fires. The species needed a complex ecosystems. So the question was, how does a species, it's showing up. If you looked at occupancy modeling, you're still seeing the species there, but can it really make a living? And so what we're seeing is that we see a big shift, a big decline before the big ecosystem change of fire, drought and fire. The mammals are declining. We're seeing plants showing up more. We don't think it's secondary effects. And what we think, it's actually a lot of currants. So they're eating berries, a lot of berries to fulfill the diet need. Now, the interesting question comes in, is that enough? And I don't, this would be the study I'd love. I wish I could get uh, somebody that worked on energetics to come in and say, okay, what kind of berry consumption are you going to need um, to, to, te to, to make up for the, the lack of mammals and can you do it? Or is this just a short term, term thing and we're soon gonna see a signal in occupancy? But you're right, if we just looked at like diversity, we might see things being the same, but some of it was historically they're eating mammals and we're getting some things like grains and other things that are probably not really what they're eating. It's probably a secondary effect. So that's a great question. We're struggling as well with, should we really pull this thing out? Could they be eating that? Or is that really, a, a, an item, a secondary item from what the prey that they're eating. So fantastic question. It's, it's, I find it's very difficult to consider the different environments as well, because you see lots of people working on climate change effects in the marine environment, and there you see range changes. Whereas in freshwater, we see all this, this work about how limited that potential is just because of the network system. That's and right. then terrestrial systems are sort of somewhere in between maybe. That's right. That's, that, that's exactly right. So guys, any other question to Mike? OK. 
Too close, too close to lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are hungry. <laughs> yeah, so I want to say thank you again to Mike. It was a, a, a really nice talk and uh, was amazing how much we can learn of uh, uh, target species integrating data, especially with eDNA and uh, other kind of approaches. Thank you very much again, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you a lot, okay, Mike. Yeah. It was a Thank pleasure. You. Thank, Thank you. you.